So here we are on Saint, in St. James Street, outside 67 Palm Isle. So come in and I'll give you a show around the club. familiar to you? For me it's someone who's great at hospitality, I mean that's really what we do, it's hospitality. Uh -huh. Rather than being in the wine business we're definitely in the hospitality business. Hey guys, hi, I'm Sid Patel, CEO of Beverage Sprint Network. I'm here with Ron and Ronans, you know, the Executive uh, Director, College CEO of the European Court of Master Sommeliers. And we're sitting in 67 Palmol. He's also the head wine uh, program, I guess, head wine buyer, you know, head of wine of uh, the Global 67 Palmol. Ronan, thanks for having me here. Thanks, you know, why, why don't you properly introduce yourself again and uh, <laughs> just, just give us a, you know, uh, your little journey, please. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so I'm CEO for European Court Master Mayors. I'm also head of wine for Six Seven Palm Out, which is now going global. We're London, Switzerland, just opened in Singapore, soon to open in Burgundy and Bordeaux, um, and many of the sites apart from that. So um, yeah, a um, bit about my journey. Uh, okay, so I grew up in the north of England, up in Yorkshire. Mm -hmm. Not very many sommeliers there. We don't make any wine up there. Yeah. Um, uh, I it's got, a cider thing, right? It's it's oh. uh, it's not even that. It's beer. Oh. It's beer. Oh. Beer country. Oh, right. Yeah, it's sheep and beer. That's what we got there. Got it. Um, so and, and I got very interested in uh, in food cooking. I started to be I started to be a chef. I got more interested in the management side of things. I kind of moved into university to do a hotel catering management degree. Okay. Uh, and then kind of discovered wine. Got into wine, and that that was it. So you know. What was your first job? My, my first job, I think it was a chef, chef barman, usually. And, you know, working in restaurants, small restaurants up in Yorkshire, you know, the barman uh, generally did the wine. You know, Sorry. small wine lists, and I, and I would look after the wine. Uh -huh. And it was just kind of like wanting to know, you know, what this, what this Cabernet Sauvignon was, what that meant. And then you realize Cabernet Sauvignon is great, it's grown in Bordeaux, but it's also grown in Napa Valley. And yeah. it's like, why is it grown there and there? And what is it, you know, and why is it different from Pinot Noir? And, you know, you know what it's like with wine, it's like an onion, you peel away the layers and, yeah, yeah. You, and you so realize... You, you got, it looks like you got curious yourself and you just wanted to know absolutely. more and more. And I just wanted to know about things and, and then you kind of realize, you know, you scratch the surface and you think, wow, this is a very deep, deep pool. And just to give some context, like how long have you been in, in this, like 25 years now? Oh, been? about 25 years. Yeah, Super. Yeah, so long time. Yeah. This is in our main dining area. So this is downstairs in the, in the, uh, in the lounge. Um, so yeah, we lay this up as a restaurant. It lays up for about 60 covers. Um, usually quite busy for lunches uh, and always very busy for dinners. So this is more like a formal restaurant. You book it like a formal restaurant. So you will book it, um, uh, uh, you know, 7 o'clock, 7.30, 8 o'clock, etc. And come through. This is all of our, all of our wine equipment we have is uh, antique. So it's usually quite sort of battered, smashed up. You know, we don't mind if it's a bit, if it's a bit chipped, a bit kind of well used. Um, it's got character. We prefer to do that rather than having, you know, exactly the same kind of carafes. So yeah. great. I think uh, you know we're sitting at one of the best wine programs out there in the world. You know, I really, uh, 67 Paul Mall is is the iconic place, especially for all other sommeliers who admire to work here as well. You know, why don't you give us a, a explanation or details about your exact role? Okay. Like what 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 does your day look like? Okay. Um, so we got so on the wine side of things, we've got a big team here. Uh, the team is about 35 people on the wine side of things. Just this location? Just this location, yeah. yeah. So we've got, ideally we've got 19 sommeliers. Uh, you know, we have uh, um, head sommeliers assistant, junior assistant, oh. junior sommelier, so a big team. Uh, we have a team of uh, bar backs, so they're the people that do all the glass polishing, mm -hmm. uh, replenish all the bars and glassware, do all that sort of stuff. Um, empty the bottle skips, that sort of thing. We have a full cellar team, so six people in the cellar. 
uh, they receive all the wines. Everything comes in, gets uh, um, uh, signed off, checked, goes into our inventory system. Every bottle gets barcoded, uh, goes into the cellar. And during the service time, the cellar team, uh, when the sommeliers request a bottle on the floor, the cellar team will deliver it to the floor. Got it. So we've got six in the cellar, we've got two wine buyers, and then we've got myself. So the whole system and is uh, two wine buyers and all this entire team. Yep. You are the captain. Yep. Yeah. 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 Got it. And your your main uh, who do you report to? Uh, I report directly to the CEO, so Grant Ashton of uh, the global yeah. Palmer. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, you know, if, uh, how does that work? Like, is that a weekly meeting or is that a, a once a month dialogue? It's it's. I mean, I think when we opened this place. Um, uh, Grant was kind. Of, Grant's a, 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 an incredible guy. He's a genius. He's a visionary. He's, 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 his brain is, is amazing. The things that he comes up with. And I met Grant. He was in this place. It was, a, it was an empty bank, and he was just in here on his own with loads of blueprints with this big idea to make it a wine club. Wow. And he spoke to me, told me about the idea, and said, "Are you interested to be involved?" And I said, "Yeah, absolutely." So um, me and Grant, uh, we we kind of text each other. We don't have formal meetings. Got it. We text each other. We ring each other as and when. We need. We're having a meeting today, but uh, as and when we need to speak, we speak. Sure. So. What What are the business deliverables? Like you know, the, the margins, the top line, you know, the cost. Um, well, the, the whole premise behind this place was uh, originally started off as a group of businessmen, um, Grant being one of them, uh, who were who had big wine collections. You know, they're most of them work in finance. All had big wine collections. Probably more wine than they're ever going to drink in their lives. Um, and they didn't want to go out and have um, to go out to restaurants and buy wine that they already owned and pay four times the amount for it. I understand. And really, what they wanted to do is uh, make a. Originally, it started off as a small supper club, where they would they would buy an old restaurant, put in a chef a few nights a week. They would take their own wine, and then they would go and, and eat steak and drink their own wine, that sort of thing. The more people Grant talked to about, the more people said, we want in. So the idea grew and grew and grew and eventually it became this. So the whole premise behind Six Seven Panar is to have very good wines, but low markups. Okay. So generally our markups are 40%. So most restaurants you would be 75%. Yeah. As in it's diet. almost like a retail markup, not bad. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're 40%. Um, and that goes, uh, the more expensive the wine is, the lower the profit margin comes down. So okay. our standard markup is 40%, but for the most expensive wines, it's 20%. Wow. So what, what, what's, what's the money driver? Like food? You expect them to eat, uh, eat well, you? It's, it's a private members club. So our business model is based on membership and yeah. membership renewal. Let, so, let's go there. How does yeah. it work? You know, how so, does... so 2,500 to join. Okay. And then 1,500 to be a member every year after that. So in the first year you pay 4,000. Uh, and then every year you pay 1,500. And it is 100% members only. 100% members only. If you're a part of the wine trade, everything's half price. So okay. if you're a, a restaurateur, a sommelier, if you're in the wine business, everything's half price. And if you technically live more than 50 miles from the club, you can sit it overseas, so it's half price again. Got it. So if we had a foreign, if we had a visiting winemaker, yeah. they would be paying uh, a quarter of the, the, the full price. Because right. they're only in London occasionally, they only, only come to us what, a couple of times a year. Um, and because they're winemakers, they're in the wine trade, uh, it's, it's, it's great benefits for them. Yeah, it's a nice place for uh, people from overseas to use it for meetings. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Nice. This is the, um, the the main bar. This is our CEO over here, Grant Ashton. Um, so this is our founder, that's Grant. Um, everything here is available by the glass. So this is the wine wall. So all the bottles in here are available by the glass. Um, it's uh, too deep. So um, everything there and a lot of stuff in the wine library and everything in the fridges down the back is all available by the glass as well. We're 100% Zalto. When we opened, we bought 19,000 Zalto glasses. Uh, we basically bought the production of Zalto for, I think it was for about four months. Wow. Um, so yeah, yeah, and we've just bought 19,000 for Singapore as well. I don't think you can buy a Zalto glass in Southeast Asia now because of that. Um, but you can see we've got We've got four Coravans on the go. We always use uh, Coravans to open all of our bottles of wine. We've got four Coravans there. We worked out that we do Coravan, we will put the Coravan needle through a cork 127.5 times a day. So we get through around about uh, 24 to 34 of the Coravan capsules a day. So you can see that, you know, we do a large amount of wines by the path. So you know, your day, right? Like coming back to that, yeah. uh, first thing you would do is 
what? Like you go to your desk and just walk me over your exact, like precise, what are the checkpoints, what do you do in the mornings, then afternoon, your, your roaming, you know, uh, your route yeah, to well, the I mean, I mean, definitely no two days are the same. Oh. I, don't, I don't have a routine. Um, uh, I can be here late at night or I can, and, and then come in early in the morning or I can come in at, late in the afternoon, whatever. So, uh, you know, nowadays, obviously everything's done mobile. So, uh -huh. so now we have, we're open in Singapore, we have big WhatsApp groups. So either I'm talking, I'm talking to the sommelier team here on our WhatsApp group here. And, but, but, you know, in the middle of the night, I'm talking to our Singaporean sommelier yeah, yeah. team as well. Uh, so you're constantly on the go on a laptop, on a mobile phone, whether I'm on a train, whether I'm on a plane, whether I'm at home, wherever. So um, I do have a desk across the road in our office, which is kind of covered in cobwebs and that sort of thing. So, Got it. That, that's just your uh, private place yeah, to work. So. Yeah, and I, and I kind of like to be, I like to be on the floor. I like to be around here with the sommeliers and with the members, to be honest, rather than tucked away in the office. Sure. So. So let, let's go deeper into the business of sommeliers, right? Yeah. Like, and I mean, that's that's something which you've got a natural thing at. Define a good sommelier, Ron. Who's a good sommelier to you? Um, for me, it's someone who's great at hospitality. I mean, that's really what we do. It's hospitality. Uh -huh. Rather than being in the wine business, we're definitely in the hospitality business. So great hospitality skills, you know, being able to welcome people, being able to make people feel comfortable and make people feel, you know, feel, feel well looked after. So to be friendly, to be sociable, um, all of those traits are very, very important. Sure. Um, uh, I think to be super curious, like we talked about earlier, I think mm -hmm. to be very curious about wine and to never, to, you know, I, I, I don't like when people call me an expert, I'm not an expert. To be an expert, you need to know everything about everything, and wine is too big. Yeah. It changes too much to know everything. True. So you've got to have a t constant hunger for knowledge and to top up that knowledge and a constant thirst for really kind of like figuring out uh, every nuance of the wine business. And it's never ending because it's so big. True. So for me, yeah, great hospitality skills, uh, uh, real, you know, thirst for knowledge and got curiosity. It. Got it. Um, you know, Good salespeople, but not doing it in a way that uh, obviously means you're upselling. Mm -hmm. um, you know, good menu knowledge. You know, good. I think that, that, that good sommeliers are, are very usually very good cooks. You know, they, okay. they cook the ingredients. They understand flavors. They understand balance. Um, so I think that yeah, most good sommeliers, you know, can, can cook pretty well. So you've got to understand all of that sort of stuff. Your great menu knowledge. I think great sommeliers need to be good. Uh, managers of people because you're usually managing teams. Uh -huh. You've got to manage people that are more junior than you. You've got to encourage them, mentor them, inspire them, do all of that sort of stuff. So I, I think, you know, the sommelier's role is uh, a niche part of the catering industry that is multifaceted uh, and involves lots of different disciplines. And I think that that's why it's so interesting. It's why it's such a great job. Yeah. Because it's not one thing. True. It's true. lots of different skills that you've got to have uh, and you bring into play. Sure. And and also humility is very important. Yeah, you know the amount of times that you know I picked up a glass and done a blind tasting and got it wrong, uh, and you know and, and and it doesn't bruise my ego. Yeah, true, true. Uh, so you've got to be humble. In and especially point. when you have uh, some customers, uh, sometimes you know they, they think they know everything, but you have yes. to sort of be humble enough to absolutely, you absolutely. know not have your ego shown. Absolutely. Um, uh, and, and, and you know, and it's kind of reading customers as well. So you know, I can go to a table as a master sommelier, yeah. uh, you know, with all this knowledge and all this experience, but a customer might not want to talk to me. They True. Might just want to be okay. Just get the cork out of the bottle, put it in the glass, and go away. True. And, and I can't feel I can't feel hurt and upset because they don't want me to talk to them. You know, so I've got to read the table, figure out if it's uh, friends on a night out who want to have a little bit of engagement, True. drink some fun wine couple on a first date both a bit nervous so you know engage them try and get a little yeah, bit of conversation yeah, yeah. going a married couple that have been together for 50 years that are not really talking so I don't talk to them a business meeting where they don't want any interaction at all they want to drink great wines a business meeting where the host is uh, has uh, really wants to impress and you go and you tell him how wonderful his choices were and all this sort of stuff <laughs> so, so it's, kind of, it. it's, it's kind of reading people and giving them the best experience uh, and, and you know understanding that you know in that situation I'm not the star there, yeah. they're the stars. True. Mm -hmm. It's true that, you know, they say uh, enhancing the experience, right? Absolutely. So as long as you're yeah. sort of lifting it up. I think there's a good there's a good um, term in the catering industry, you know, which is, you know, you never notice great service. 
you know, great service just happens. True, true. Uh, you know, a, an intrusive service is bad service. This is the wine library. Yeah. So uh, basically, you know, you can eat in here as well. This okay. is a, this is a table. This is marble from Thassos. Apparently, it's the whitest marble in the world. It's from Greece. So we do this a lot for tastings. When wine merchants come, when we get um, wine producers come and they want to do a tasting with the sommelier team, we'll do it in here. And then members can eat in here as well. And anything that we do by the glass, literally, uh, our wine list is an uh, iPad. So it's very easy to suddenly put something on by the glass. So uh, a member can come in here. They can literally look around and say, oh, look, you've got the you've got Obreon 2012. I'd love to try that. And we say, no problem. We can do it by the glass if you want a glass of it. And then it just gets taken out of here. We click a box on our iPad wine list. It costs everything out. It puts it on by the glass. And then we move the bottle into the wine wall there. And then when it's done, you move it back. Uh, no, no, it's no. These are just full bottles, and these these are semi-full bottles. But from the menu, you just remove it again. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And put it back. Yeah, by the bottle. Absolutely. As soon uh, as it's sold, it disappears off the off the off the nice. off the list. Yeah. So um, we had to open with a electronic wine list. You know, with so many wines, there's no way we could do a paper wine list. Yeah, you know, yeah. we would be changing hundreds of pages a day. Sure. Had to be electronic. It works in real time off a website. So basically, when a bottle is sold, it disappears off the list. Uh, I think you said uh, one of the uh, some good uh, case points. I, I want to go deeper into that, right? You said business meeting, uh, a couple, you know, uh, maybe a husband and wife and kids. Maybe I, I don't think so. Kids are allowed here, but something like that. But there are different types of uh, personalities, right? Yeah. Give me like uh, a good greet you would usually do if it's a business, uh, you know, meeting, and yeah. then you say, you know, how would you approach that? Hey, gentlemen, you know, or yeah. ladies, or I don't know. How, how, what, what are the tips there? It's, I mean, for me, it's. Uh, um, you know, people arrive, they get water, they get bread, whatever, they get menus, and then you bring the wine list and you put the wine list down. You definitely don't give it to the man or the lady, you give it to the table. You Got it. You say, who would like to look at the wine list? Got it. You don't assume that the man's going to order it. It could True. be the lady that's going to order nowadays. So you offer the wine list, you put it down and you say, I'll leave the wine list with you. I'll let you look for a few minutes and then I'll come back. And if I can offer any assistance, I'm quite happy to do that. Got it. You don't go and you hang there and you say, can I give you some advice with the wine list? Got it. Because a lot of people want to look at the wine list. They, they, they know about wine and wine picking and things. Yeah. So you give them the wine list and you say, I'll be back. Got it. You have a look. And then come back and you say, did you have a chance to look at the wine list? Can I help in any way? And then if they uh, if they want to make their own choices, right? Yep. If they want uh, a little bit of advice, and I think you need to establish your uh, professionalism by saying something like, if they say, uh, what, what would you suggest? Yeah. And you say, okay, well, I know the lady's having the scallops to start with, and then she's following that with the lamb, and, and you're going to have the, uh, the three and four gras followed by the beef wellington. Uh -huh. So you, you immediately kind of, you look at the check, you know what they're eating so that you can successfully recommend some nice ah, wine. Very interesting. One. You make sure that you know what they're eating. As soon as you, you, you show the guests that you know something like that, then they're like, this guy's actually taking Th That's a good time. point. Let me pause there. So for example, if there is a 14 pound burger yeah. versus a 40 pound steak, Absolutely. your offerings can immediately change, right? Absolutely, yeah. Someone's yeah, having yeah. Dover Sole and the other one's having you know, char grill true, and venison. True. They're both very different dishes. True. And then you, and then, you know, and I think what a good sommelier, the question that they should always ask is a good sommelier doesn't say, I'll tell you what's good. I'll tell you what I like. It should be, tell me what you like. Yeah. What kind of wines do you like? And if they're talking about, uh, you know, I like inexpensive Rioja, yep. you know, you're in a certain price area of the list. And if they say, well, at the moment I'm getting through my 61 Petruses, then you know, okay, you're in a different area of the wine list. You got it. Um, and I think to be very flexible with things like wines by the glass, you know, you can say, well, maybe I'd suggest you have a couple of glasses to start with. Yep. You know, with your scallops, maybe a white burgundy, maybe your, with your foie gras, maybe a glass of Sauternes or German Riesling. Um, and then look at a bottle, which will either compromise or maybe uh -huh. a couple of glasses for main course. Okay. Um, but it's really kind of about, yeah, establishing the fact that you're there to look after the customer. You're not there to impose your will on them. You're there, and I have no problem talking about budget with people as well. I mean, some people are like, you can never talk about price. Yeah. You know, I'm quite happy to say to whoever's ordering the wine, you know. What, what, how do you say that? Like, any uh, good you ways usually, to... usually indicate it on the list. So okay. I, you may say something like, you might be looking at the white burgundies, and you might point at something like a Petit Chablis and say, are you looking for something from this region? 20 pounds. Are you looking for something from this region? 60 pounds. Or are you looking for something for this region? Yeah. 150 pounds. Yeah. Um, uh, and then they'll say, oh, I'm looking for something for that region no, no, or whatever. No, no. So then you get an idea what budget they're working on. Um, and it's really just about asking, asking them questions. Yeah, yeah. You know? uh, 
And then, you know, when you start to know people and they start to know you, then they start to be more trusting of you and yeah. they start to be more adventurous. At some point, you would want to close that, right? Like if it's just uh, yeah. a lot, you would say, you know what, I think uh, this Pinot Noir from New Zealand would be a good start. Absolutely, yeah. And I think to a certain extent, you know, when you first meet people, to do more of the down selling is good because True. people come in and they think, oh, this sommelier is going to this sommelier is going to rip me off. Yeah. You're, going to, you're going to recommend the most expensive bottle of wine on the list. Yeah. But if, the, you know, they say, you know, oh, I usually drink, uh, you know, uh, Von Romany, then you could say, ah, well, I'll tell you what, we've got this really good Marcenet, which is fantastic. You know, yeah. it's in the similar region of Burgundy. This is great value for money, great producer, amazing vintage, you should try that. Yeah. And if they see that, you know, you're recommending something they're quite happy to spend hundred pounds, and you recommend something for fifty pounds. They'll be like, "Okay, this guy, nice. this guy, this guy's good." Super. So here, here's a wine list. Please so, yeah. explain. So here's a wine list. So like, say, uh, everything we had to have it electronic. Mm -hmm. um, we we have twenty of these on the go. So ten upstairs, ten downstairs. Diapads. Yeah, I got it. So we have the lounge list because we're downstairs in the lounge. It's different from the list upstairs. Okay. Um, we have the sommelier shortlist if people just want to go for a selection of wines that we think are really good at the moment. Got it. So they want just a, just a condensed list really. Everything by the glass, what we're selling in the bar, tea, coffee, and then all the artwork that we've got around. All the artwork is owned by members. Um, usually they're, they're pretty serious art collectors and then art changes every couple of months. And art meaning wine? Uh, no, art meaning the pictures on the walls. Oh, so, the, so at the moment these are all Lara Julian Just as a reader yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, just it. out of interest. Um, but if we're going to look at something like, if we look at the list, because the list is so big, we can filter it in any way that we want to filter it. So we can filter it by style. Nice. Uh, we can filter it by country. And then if we're in a country like France, we can filter it by region. So we can go to it to any region that we want. You know, let's say we're in Burgundy and let's say we want specifically, we want Chablis, we can do that. We can do bottle sizes as well. So halves, magnum, mm -hmm. bigger formats than that. If you want to search by a certain grape, you can do that. By a producer's name, you can do that. By vintage, you can do that. And then by a bottle. So if you've got a big party and you want to make sure that we've got you know, four or five bottles in, you can do that. Um, you can search on the list, the sommeliers list, or specifically by the glass. So okay. if you want a shabbly by the glass, you can put all of that in, press by the glass, and it'll show us all the shabblies that you got. Got it. You can just reset that. Uh, we don't search by price. Got it. Um, but is it shown when? It, oh, yeah, absolutely, all right. yeah. So if we go to the main list, You'll see these are all the champagnes that we've got. So we start with wow, champagnes. Wow, big list. <laughs> yeah, big list of champagne. So that's everything sparkling, basically, from there upwards. But you can go to one of those wines. So let's pick something nice. Let's pick a nice Krug. So you can go to something like Krug. And you click on that. It will give you oh, nice. some notes all about Krug, about the house, the history of the house. It will tell you how much it is. If it's by the glass, it will have a by the glass breakdown of a 25, 50 mil, uh, uh, 125, that sort of thing. So uh, this uh, particular uh, menu can uh, is itself a great training tool, right? For Absolutely. because you got all the data here. Absolutely, and this is the website, so all members have access to this. So they can stay okay. at home and look at the list. Got so it. They can think. They about can what plan they their. So, uh, you know, for our financial guys who are a bit geeky on this sort of stuff, prices, price index. You know, we've got things like Parker points nice. for the wines, uh, other wines that they produce. And then a bit more sort of technical for the sommeliers, you know, when the sommeliers want to know how many bottles we've got, we can click on that and it'll tell us we've got four bottles in stock. Fantastic. And, and this information is meant for the public? No, this is just... Oh, this is your, your this login. Is, yeah. So we don't use order pads and pens and paper and stuff sure. like that. Everything comes off the iPad. Got it. So this is up in the library, so just around there, uh -huh. Sieve 05. Ah, the location. It's a location there, that's all sparkling wine. Fantastic. Um, and it'll tell us where the location is in the cellar. Um, and then there is a spot around here, which is always hard to find. You can click on that. You put in the sommelier puts in their passcode, um, they, and they can order that direct from the seller. Yeah. So let's say I'm in the wine library. Uh, I put my passcode in, um, and I'll say something like wine library. I want one bottle, and I want it today. And someone from the seller will and come and do it. The seller will bring it up. Yeah. Fantastic. So, uh, and then submit request. So everything can be ordered off the wine list. To be honest, uh, if we're looking at things like by the glass. Uh -huh. You know, the buy the glass. Oh, another quite cool thing is we have um, a sort of my selection. So Your um, selection? Well, it's like a shopping basket. Yeah, yeah. So let's say you're looking through the list and you say, oh, look, they've got Egli Urier. Um, I, I might buy that. I might get that. Okay. Oh, and you've got this uh, Recoredo from Carver. I might buy that. Oh, you've got Pesac Leonion from the Danish Valley. I might have that. Now, what was I thinking about? Just one question came. How do you do 125? Uh, like, it's all this are different measurements you're going to give it. In. Yeah, okay. yeah. So you can go to your selection of things that you've 
you've been thinking about? This helps a lot in, in the prize budget sometimes. Yeah. I want to try that, but I just want to yeah. have a little less, yeah. And you know what it's like when you look at a wine list? Yeah. You get to page three and you can't remember what was on page true, one that true. you liked. So, for example, let's say you wanted a glass of... Um, something nice let's say you wanted to go for a La Mission Aubryon 2000 mm -hmm. if you wanted a 25 mil measure so just a little taste mm -hmm. it would cost 27 pounds 60 if you wanted a 125 standard glass it would be 138 and if you wanted a 375 half a carafe uh, so a half bottle equivalent that's how much it would cost um, but the 125 you can have multiples of so if you wanted a 50 it's basically double that so all of that is reflected there as well it will tell you all that sort of stuff let, let's, let's go on the interview part, right? Because I think uh, yeah. you, you, you were just having one candidate. I would yeah. love to know, you know, some uh, five to six great interview questions yeah. to identify, uh, you know, some Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, you know, uh, I think everyone can pick up a book and learn about wine. Everyone can go online and learn about all the vintage, all the, all the classic, the classic things about wine. What you can't teach anyone is attitude. Mm -hmm. So for me, people have to come with the right attitude. And my number one rule when interviewing people is all about, um, uh, my number one rule when people are working here is about teamwork. So we have a team of 19 sommeliers. Some are taking their master sommeliers exams, some are doing their advanced, some are doing intro certified, some haven't even started. Some are doing WSET levels one, two, and three, whatever. Um, but for me, everyone on the team respects each other. Whatever level of knowledge you're at, everyone supports one another. Everyone works together as a team. You you respect the, the hierarchy within the team. Got it. You know, but you, you you never disrespect somebody because they don't have a huge knowledge or they're learning. You never embarrass a colleague because they don't know something. Yep. Every sommelier should feel that they can go to any other sommelier with a question and say, I don't really understand the grapes of uh, you know, Barada or something. What are the questions you would ask uh, to find out that they are a good team player? Um, it's usually just chatting with them, you know, where they've worked before, um, uh, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what, what style of wine list they've worked before, what kind of teams they've worked before, okay. if it's in a big team, small team. Um, and you, you can get a good feeling for someone's uh, attitude after five minutes of talking got to it. them. So you just got to stimulate conversation with them and get them talking to you. Uh -huh. And then after that, you can get a good idea. And let's say about three or four business uh, problem kind of questions, so you know that they actually know how to solve the problem, uh, what are they? Uh, you might ask some questions, you know, things like, uh, might be technical questions, yeah. like, you know, you know, for example, you know, what, what, what temperature would you serve a, a non-vintage champagne compared to a 1959 Dom Perignon, for example? Interesting, yeah. So they would, you would hope that they would say, uh, um, maybe I would serve non-vintage champagne in a, in a, in a fruit, and I would serve it quite cold, whereas a Dom Perignon, an old Dom Perignon, I would serve it like a white burgundy, put it in a slightly bigger glass and at a warmer temperature. So some of those technical questions, you know, you would ask them, what wines would you always decant? Uh, you know, what, what's your rule of thumb for decanting? Okay. And they may say, I wouldn't decant most burgundies, but any Bordeaux, say more than 10 years old, I would decant. Mm -hmm. So that sort of thing. What about like uh, upselling uh, or uh, selling? Yeah. You know, uh, what kind of question you would you know that they are good at it? Uh, well, I mean, again, another rule here really is that, uh, you know, with the members, we never know what their level of knowledge is. And some of them are massive collectors who have incredible knowledge about certain regions and certain wines. So another golden rule is, you know, you never bullshit a customer. True. So you never make anything up. If you don't know, you say, I don't know. Yeah. If they say, which is a better vintage, this vintage or this vintage? If you don't know, you say, I think it's this one, but I'm not sure, but let me check. I'll yeah. go and ask somebody. Yeah. And that's why you need to be confident enough to go to one of your colleagues and say, which is the better vintage in Barolo? Is it, uh -huh. is it 14 or is it 16? Got it. And, uh, um, so yeah, that sort of thing is very important. So honesty, integrity, sure. team working, all of those sort of things are very important. Um, and the rest you can teach, you know, the wine knowledge, uh, all of that sort of stuff you can teach. Attitude. Um, and that, that teamwork and element, you, you, it has to come from the person. And what about the onboarding, right? Like, let's say someone started, this is their day one, they yeah. just walk in and say, yeah. hey, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, what does your onboarding process look like? What do you want them to do first, your day one, day two, and so on? Uh, usually, say over the first month, it would be, uh, we always put them with one of the more sommelier, senior sommeliers, so they always just shadow them. So okay. We work with them. Okay. Uh, it would be a lot of things like uh, pouring water and topping up. So getting to learn the table numbers, getting to get a feel for the room, which tables are where. 
Okay. Uh, generally, we say, you know, we wouldn't put a new sommelier in with a 6,000 bin wine list and say, okay, go and speak to this millionaire over here. Uh, it, it, that would take them a couple of months. Wow, okay. So it's more about, it's, it's more about for them just to feel, to feel confident in their job. So that they know the tables, they start to know some of the customers, they know where everything is, they feel that if a guest asks them a question, that they're, they're, they're sufficiently experienced enough here to be able to, 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 to solve whatever, whatever the guest asks them to do. So it's, it's kind of a case of shadowing, Got it. Uh, getting to learn the system, getting to learn, you know, we have a, all of our wine list is on an iPad, so it's pretty, it's pretty comprehensive. Then do you have some, some like question checklist that, okay, yeah. you know, I, I want to reevaluate your like yeah. knowledge? There is, we, we tend to have a month's probationary period, so okay. when anyone comes after a month, we'll sit down and chat with them. Uh, you know, we have uh, various forms that will do uh you know they will say they'll they'll open two or three times with the senior sommelier and then on the fourth time they'll open on their own so it means that they come in at 10 o'clock in the morning they set the ice buckets up they clean down the bar they set everything up they make sure all the glasses are in place all that sort of mise en place sort of thing mm -hmm. so they do that a couple of times with the senior sommelier and then come in and do it on their own and all of that sort of stuff is locked similar for the closing procedure um, and then you know we have we have two different dining areas. What do you so mean closing procedure? Meaning? Oh, so so uh, winding up the cleaning up, okay. making sure everything's away, Got making it. sure everything's clean and tidy, put away. Uh, then we'd have you know a cleaning routine, which is generally weekends. You know we have a lot of silver here, silver buckets, silver okay. coasters. So all of that sort of stuff needs to be clean. All the decanters need to go through cleaning every couple of weeks. So I guess initially they would want to do all the uh, low, I yeah. mean uh, ground level stuff, right? Exactly. Yeah, they need to do the basics. Absolutely. Right. And you know anyone here that's a senior sommelier has been through all of that. So Correct. That's why they can they can show you. They can say that's not how we do the silver buckets. We do it like this. Yeah. And yeah. they know because they've done it. Super curious to know uh, some fun stories uh, here. You know, uh, what what was your highest sale like a bottle which was purchased just in a in a like very casual form. Hey, bring me that. And you were like, whoa. Oh, I mean, I mean, we've had a lot. You know, lots of things like Romilly Contis and things like that. But I remember when we first started. Um, because if you think that this is a private members club, so the members come a lot, yeah. you know. So for the chef, it's a challenge because he's got to keep the menu very varied because people come several times a week. And if, uh, they, if they've been two or three times and look at the menu true. and they think, I've eaten all of that. True. Um, but then again, there's some classics that need to stay, like the burgers, the steaks, yeah. that sort of stuff. Everything's very seasonal. It's not a French menu or an Italian menu. It's very eclectic, so it's yeah. world, world cuisine. Uh, um, but you know, when we first opened, it was great because I remember we had a guy came in and he looked at the list and we had a, like I say, 40% markup. We had a 64 Chateau Le Tour and he came in for lunch on his own and he drank a bottle of 64 Chateau Le Tour and had a burger. And he said, you're 64 Le Tour, it's only 500 pounds or something like that. And he said, I'm having that with my burger. Wow. And we thought, <laughs> we thought that's exactly what this club is about. It's about people coming in and enjoying good wine yeah. and then having whatever they want to eat with it and just having a great time and just celebrating the fact that you can drink 64 at all. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's cool. Nice. You know, one of the ideas about this place is that there's, you know, there's, there's, there's so much good wine made in the world yeah. and so much of it gets put away into the backs of Euro calves or into the cellars yeah. and gets left for a special occasion. Um, and a lot of it goes into restaurant wine lists and just sits there for years and years and years and never gets sold because the markups are crazy. True. The thing about this place is that we want people to be drinking good wine all the time. It's a very nice, uh, unique uh, differentiating factor, yeah. you know, because you're giving the ambience of a nice uh, yeah, place. Yeah. Yeah. And with 40%, you know, you're, you're sort of, uh, that's amazing. Like you, it's a retail markup uh, exactly. at, a, at a proper Michelin star sort uh, of exactly. setup. Exactly. And you know, what also guests can do, what members can do is they can bring their own wine. So oh, we have nice. a 20 pound corkage. That's it, pretty yeah. good. So. Um, uh, you know, a members men, members can come in with some extraordinary bottles. You know, twenty nine Romilly Contis, uh, you know, nineteen hundred Chateau Margaux, things like that. So you never know. Someone might turn up for nice. You know, with a carrier bag, and it will have something extraordinary. In the in the recent like last twelve months, right? Uh, pandemic was there, and all that stuff happened. So what, do you remember? I mean, I'm sure you do. But give me two like real business problems you were faced with, and how you solved it. Uh, what yeah. approach you did, uh, you know, some wins that you have yeah. on your shoulder, like, you know, uh, which you were proud of in your career? Uh, well, I mean, you know, a lot of our business model works on membership and membership renewal. So uh -huh. when COVID hit, we're kind of like, if we're going to be shut for a year, and then after that year, we go to all the members and say, it's time to renew. Uh, they'd be like, well, you've been closed for a year. 
So we, we tried to take the wine experience that we do here online. So we tried to take what we do here into people's living rooms. So um, since we use so much argon and we're so used to Coravan, again, it's a Grand Ashton idea. Um, we started bottling in small, and it's very standard now, everyone's doing it. We were the first to do it. So we were buying little perfume bottles from Italy, 100 mil perfume bottles from Italy, and we were doing 75 mil fills, topping it up with argon, um, putting, packing them into a case of six, and we were sending that out to people, and we would accompany that by an online uh, Zoom. Zoom meeting. Wow. That you could either watch live, or you could watch um, uh, afterwards. So you could order your pack of wine, and then you could sit in your living room, you could put the Zoom meeting up on the big plasma screen, you could get out your bunch of Zaltos, and you could pour all the wines in there, and we'd have whoever, Frederic Angera from Chateau Le Tour doing a Le Tour tasting. Nice. So during that period of lockdown, we did over a thousand Zoom meetings. Wow. With winemakers from all over the world. Wow. Uh, you know, we did all the top guys in Napa, uh, we did, you know, people like Francis Ford Coppola did England Nook for us, Bill Harlan did Harlan Wines, all the first gross did stuff, um, Olivia Krug did things for us, uh, you know, Egon Muller did things with us. Um, so it was, we were doing five a day, five well, days a week. How, how do you grow your wine membership sales? You know, is that a sales and marketing activity, which is like a, you know, which you it's, guys do? Or I mean, we, we have very good social media. Our social media people, our marketing people are very good at that, you know, but really, it's, it's really word of mouth. Okay. That, so it's more of an inbound thing. You don't yeah. have really an outgoing sales uh, philosophy or a process where we, okay, we really need two members need a week or something like that? No, we really don't need it. You know, at the moment, membership here is about three and a half thousand. Mm -hmm. um, we know some clubs in London that are 15,000 members, but it's impossible for anyone to get a table. True. We don't want it to be like that because, you know, part of the membership is yeah. you feel that you can come to your club. Yeah. And when you come to your club, there'll be a table there for you. Table. So we don't want it to be overbooked and have you know, great waiting lists and things like that. So we kind of cap it around three and a half thousand. Some people realize that uh, maybe they don't use the club very often, so, yep. they, so they drop out. But we generally have a, probably about a 10% dropout rate for membership renewal. Um, but then we've always got many people that will take that. And, and you know, we, we kind of know now by word of mouth. Got it. So people that are members. Yeah. And as a member here, you can bring up to five guests. Plus renewal is a big thing as well. You want yeah. to focus there first, right? Yeah. Is it every year or yeah, is there a five-year year. thing as yeah, well? Yeah, every year, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. People, people can buy a lifetime membership. On the, you know, apart from the HR, the sommelier part of yeah. it, people part, you know, there is a science behind the menu planning, the deco. Yeah. Uh, based on your experience, you know, this is for the restaurant owners, right? Yeah. Like what elements they can pay attention to or checklist yeah. to, to uh, help drive wine sales? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, Coravan for us has been, you know, an absolute game changer. You know, we, we do, we, uh, we do 900 wines by the glass, and most of them are with Coravan. Uh, the, but, you know, you've you got to use Coravan correctly. And we serve, we store all of our wines by the glass uh, horizontally. So, you know, you've got the bottle, it lies on its side. So you've got the, the, air, the, 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 the air space with argon gas in it. Uh -huh. It's not stood up, so the argon's not pushing directly against okay. the cork. So there's no chance of any leakage. It's laid on its side in a storage cabinet, which is, which is kept cool and dark. So that sort of stuff, it means that we can keep wines literally for years. Uh -huh. so that's why we can have such a big list. Well. So um, if you're gonna use Coravan, you know, make sure that you've got the right storage space to put the bottles after you've used the Coravan. Uh -huh. um, you know, a big selection of wines by the glass um, is very important for, for a restaurateur. But you know, I think, I think that, you know, driving wine sales for a restaurateur, the main thing is, um, you don't necessarily need to have a sommelier, a formal sommelier with a great badge and all that sort of stuff. But you need to have someone who's dedicated to, to beverage service. Got it. You know, liquid sales are usually your biggest profit margin. Yeah. You know, coffee, water, wine, beer. Yeah. They all, you know, you, you have two guys doing that. Yeah. And you have 10 chefs in the kitchen and 15 people in front of the house. So 25 people doing the food, two guys doing the beverage. And they're, they're, that's your biggest profit center. True. So you've got to have someone that's really and not the restaurant manager who's also managing the customers and the staff and the bookings and the laundry and doing all that sort of stuff and on the side you say you're looking after the wine list as well yeah you know you need someone that's gonna make sure that deliveries are correct yeah. and that you're paying for what you, you, you think you're paying for yeah uh that, that you know the volumes of wine if you ordered a case you're getting 12 bottles you're not getting a case of six yeah so making sure all of that stock is right 
and then if you have faulty wines, making sure that goes back to the supplier. Mm-hmm. So I think you know, often someone's cellar can be, you know, it can be a very very expensive thing, and it's neglected. You know, yeah. you don't really have someone looking after it. Managing but I think a lot of times they need to be uh, like reaching the affordability factor as well, right? Yeah. You you yeah. think that it pays. Uh, itself like I think so yeah and I think so and even if that's a, an upsell you know when you're in a busy restaurant you've got four people they've drunk a bottle of red wine um, and you, you, you you're kind of looking at the glasses and you think the glasses are getting a bit low yeah but I'm busy because I've got to do this I've got to do this I've got to do the True. other but if you've got someone there who can go and say would you like another bottle you know, yeah the customers are probably gonna say yeah so you sell that second bottle uh, let's let's talk about the model yeah and after that I would love to know you know, uh, some, uh, what do you look for when buying wines, right? Okay. Um, well, to a certain extent, you know, we have all of our, a lot of our members have a huge amount of wine. So we have some, we have a consignment model where the members that have huge amounts of wine, uh, they can bring us, you know, they might bring us a hundred cases of wine. We put it in our cellar. Mm -hmm. We basically can sell that wine. Um, they can come in and drink any of that wine at any time for 20 pounds corkage. But we put all of that wine on the list. Got it. When we sell it, we will credit their account with the cost price of that wine and we take our profit margin. So let's say they bring us a, a case of Merceau, it's a £150 a bottle, we sell it for £250 a bottle. As mm -hmm. uh, soon as we sell a bottle out of their case, their their account is credited by 150 we make 100 pounds profit but can any member uh, do this or do you it. have to make a decision as a buyer as well a any member can do it you know if they come and they say i've got you know 3000 cases of wine from azerbaijan we might say we're not interested but if they come and they've got good wine you can say absolutely nice um, and and the great thing about that is that you know members that are doing that usually have 2 or 3000 pounds credited on their account Okay. So they want to use that. So they'll come in more and more regularly and they'll bring more and more guests with them to use up the credit that they've got on their account. Got it. So it means that we can have a huge wine list. Yep. We don't have the overheads of buying all that wine. You know, we can have a big wine list and we don't actually own that stock. Yeah. Members who have big collections of wine can uh, reduce their collections by yeah. putting it with us. Um, and, and you know they can come in and drink it for £20 corkage and they get the credit for um, wines that we sell. So nice. it kind of works And I think everybody. they have this Western interest in some way, right? In, yeah. In, in being more associated with you guys. Uh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. What about the suppliers, right? Like if, if I'm a winery uh, trying to pitch you, yeah. um, what is the process and what do you really look for in making a buying decision? Um, I mean, first of all, quality. You know, quality, uh, quality compared to, you know, price ratio. Um, uh, there, there's no real criteria as long as the wine is good, as long as we feel that it's an artisan product, as long as we feel that there's, you know, there's a lot of passion behind it. Got it. You know, we've got a big wine list, so there's a lot of bins to fill. So, you know, we have wine from 42 different countries. Um, you know, our classics will be Bordeaux, Burgundy, Champagne, they're the main sellers. Uh -huh. but, you know, we have wine from everywhere, from Bulgaria, Croatia, Romania. Uh, Japan, China, you know, wine from everywhere. So as long as it's quality wine, that's the main criteria. And what about like marketing support? Are there any uh, other things that uh, suppliers can do for you to, to yeah. help you in reselling or even to help you in getting a placement? I mean, we do have function rooms here. You know, we have private rooms. We have a few small private rooms. We have one big private room downstairs, the St. James room. Today, we've got a wine merchant in there who's doing their annual tasting. Okay. But we regularly do things with things like people like LVMH. They'll come and they'll do events with us. Penfolds will regularly do events with us. Got it. Um, so all of that kind of, you know, they can help market their products. That's a great way to help your, to your event business. Yeah, basically. exactly. Yeah. And we usually do something which might be a full day event, say Penfolds doing 50 wines to taste. The morning will all be uh, trade people, journalists, sommeliers. Got and then it. the evening we'll sell tickets to our members. Um, so Penfolds have the opportunity to sell to private customers and also to show the wines to the trade. Roger that. Cool. And it's fascinating, I'm sure you, you would know this, but uh, have you ever compared dessert sales with the booze sales? Because it's like you're on the second glass, third glass, yeah. you would have ordered a cheesecake now, you know, yeah, let's, yeah, let's go yeah. do the all in yeah. and then coffee again, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, that for me, that's probably a bit more where, you know, the waiting staff come in and they sell that. Uh -huh. And we always do, you know, with our staff, with our, with our waiting staff here, we do lots of wines by the glass, dessert wines by the glass training. Got it. So, you know, for example, we, at the moment, we've got a dessert called Snickers, uh -huh. which is kind of like a chocolate dessert with uh -huh. uh, uh, salted caramel in it. So it's kind of like a Snickers bar. Yeah. And we've got a great Madeira that goes with that. 
and we get the waiters to taste that, taste the Snickers, taste the Madeira, and then it's just automatic that anyone that orders a Snickers, they can say, oh, we've got this amazing Madeira that goes wow. well with that. And nine times out of 10, the customer will say, okay, we'll take it. Amazing, amazing. What about master sommelier, right? Yeah. So uh, you uh, you head the European uh, side of things. Yeah. Uh, what does that role look like? Could you please elaborate on you know what do you exactly do in Master Sommelier program? Yeah. Well, I mean the, the Master Sommelier program, similar to the WSET, is is um, uh, four different levels. It's the introductory to start with, which is not really like. It's not a very, very basic course. It's an introductory to our exam. So if you want to take that introductory course, you need to have a certain level of knowledge. You probably need to have worked as a sommelier for a certain amount of time. We really try and keep the master sommelier exams for people who work in hospitality and work on the floor. Got it. You know, so if, you're a, if you run a wine shop or if you're a wine merchant, we recommend that you go to WSET. Okay. Because there's always a service element for our exam. So it's really designed for somebody who works on the floor in a restaurant. And what is, what is the whole program? Like, are, you know, are there, uh, would, you, would you walk us through the program itself? Yeah. So we have level one, which is introductory, level okay. two certified, level three, the advanced exam, and then level four is the master sommelier. Exam. And introductory is like theory, reading about wines? All, all of them usually have a, a three elements. So they always have a theoretical part to the okay. exams. They have a tasting element, and then they have a knowledge element. And you've got, uh, got to pass the one for the two. Yeah. It's a prerequisite to yeah. jump. Yeah. Okay. So for example, the introductory, there's no tasting, but there's a very basic practical, which uh -huh. is opening a bottle of white wine, serving it at a table, and then there's a 65 multiple choice uh, questionnaire. And then going right up to the, the advanced exam, it's a, it's a room set up like a restaurant, uh -huh. and people go in and they do a practical exam, which will include opening sparkling wine, decanting wine, talking to customers at a table, and then a sit-down theory exam, and then six wines to taste blind. Got it. What is it that uh, they can get in Master Sommelier program that they would not usually get it outside? You know, like what's different? Um, well, I mean, I think it's, it's, it has become, you know, the most, uh, the most sought after on trade uh, wine qualification that you can get. You know, I think that, that generally, uh, and generally I like to think of the fact is that, you know, when you become a master sommelier, it's not just because you've, you've got a certificate, you've got a badge, that doesn't make you a master sommelier. Mm -hmm. It's probably the 10 years or so before you pass that exam of working as a sommelier in high-end places, visiting wine regions, doing all that sort of stuff. Right. So, so it's it you know the, the, the badge and the certificate don't mean anything. It's, yeah. it's who you become on that journey. Got it. So generally, if you've got the master sommelier diploma, it's an indication of you've you have it at a long journey. You, you've got a lot of experience. You've got a long journey in this sort of this sort of profession. You've got a big uh, theoretical knowledge. You've probably tasted some great wines. You know a lot of people in the wine trade. Got it. You've travelled. You're experienced. So it's probably a guarantor to uh, to an employer that you know that badge means you know years of experience. Fair enough. What's the application process? You know, how can people apply? What are the prerequisites? Um, really, I mean, for you know to start on the program, you need to have worked in a restaurant. You need to have worked uh, in wine service. You need to have some kind of knowledge already. Okay. Um, and and really, it's kind of being in the trade. Okay. Know? We do get occasionally things like doctors that will come along and they'll say, oh, I want to learn about wine, I'm going to do your courses. And we yeah. say, it's not really for you. you but know? do they have to have like some WSET or? No, no, it, it's a, nothing. Got it's, it. It's, it's, it's kind of trade experience. Is there an entrance exam? No, no, so anyone can do it. Got but it. we do, you know, the thing about the, the exams is the only people that teach and run on the exams are master sommeliers. Got it. And there's not that many of us. So it means that the places on those courses are limited. Okay. So we're, we're quite happy to take to take people. Um, we don't think it's right for you. Got we don't it. think that you've, your your knowledge is sufficient enough yet. Yeah. We don't think that your experience working on the floor is is, is enough yet. Got it. Um, but go away, do X, Y, and Z, and then come back and see us another time, and we'll put you on a course. Sure. Uh, what are the applications? Uh, you know, apart from the restaurant side, yeah. which is very clear. What other areas have you seen them, you know, applying uh, MS uh, skills? Uh, well, I mean, what's what's been very interesting in the last 15 years, we've been in China every year running courses regularly. You know, twice in Hong Kong, once in Shanghai, and we really see that the whole sommelier profession, you know, has 
has, has got better and better and better. And now, you know, the sommeliers in places like China and uh, Singapore are as good as you would find in Europe or the States, you know, very high levels of knowledge, very high levels of skills. But we're, um, we, 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 in fact, I'm going flying tomorrow to Mumbai. Yeah. And it'll be the fourth time that we've done courses in Mumbai. I was going to tell you that one of, uh, we have a team in India as well. Okay. And one of my writer, Arjun, Oh, yeah. Is coming there oh, right, uh, on tenth okay. of March, I believe. Oh yeah, well, and he's up. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. On Sunday. Yeah, he said that you were teaching this yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. And, but it, that's a really great thing because um, the sommelier profession you can see is starting to snowball in India. Yeah. You can start to see that uh, employers are starting to think, yeah, what is this? What is this sommelier job? What does it do? Yeah. And they're realizing, ah, it actually give, makes us profit. Yeah. This is good. This affects our bottom line. True. We're interested in this sommelier. True. We're interested in supporting, you know, the young girls and guys that work for us we're yeah. interested in getting them on this thing we're interested in paying for their education and do you see more demand coming up from Asia these days absolutely yeah absolutely um, you know and we, we're doing in South Africa as well so that's that's an, another snowball effect got it yeah um, yeah it'll be a fourth year in India and we really see uh, that you know young people out there are really starting to think this is many a thing I can make a career out of this True. this is something good um, and the restaurants and the hotels are getting behind it. The wine merchants are getting behind it. Yeah. The glass ma the glass makers out there are getting behind it. And everyone's saying, we like this sommelier idea. This is great. This is yeah, good for people, the industry. This is giving people a career. And True. the young kids are super enthusiastic about it. So that, that for me, is one of the greatest parts of the job. Nice. Running the MS is yeah. to see, to mentoring to people see and the enthusiasm and the passion coming yeah. out from, from these young guys. So, nice, yeah. nice. Uh, just a closing remark for yeah. uh, uh, sommeliers, you know, young sommeliers yeah. trying to grow their career. So you can look in the camera and just give some some good tips on yeah. how to grow the career. Um, yeah, for young sommeliers who wanna who wanna get on in this profession, I think you've got to be uh, you've got to um, accept the fact that you're gonna work long hours on the floor, accept the fact that you're gonna have a limited social life because you're gonna have to go away and study and taste and travel and do all of that sort of stuff. You're gonna have to pay attention to what you're eating and what you're drinking and whether that works or not. So be prepared for long hours, hard work, lots of dedication. But the most important thing, you know, stay humble, uh, stay respectful of who you're doing this for and you're doing it for your guests. You're there to make sure that they have a great time in your restaurant. Um, and as long as you can keep that mentality and you can stay humble and you can stay professional, you'll go a long way as a sommelier.